everyone and welcome back to Sunday Talks Within the Nine-Sided Circle. I am one of your two hosts back this week from the wedding I was attending last week. My name is Nor Kyle. And I'm the other one of your hosts who was not at a wedding last week and I'm Mushtaq Ali. So back at it again with the Sunday Talks. And yes, do we need to do a spiel? Um, sure, I'll toss you for it. Heads or tails? <laughs> Tail. You lose. All right. Okay. So here we are. I will do the spiel. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching here live or if you're watching here with us on YouTube on the replay, we are so happy to have you. We even have someone we don't get to see very often here today. That's always nice. Along with all of our favorite regulars. Unfortunately, not all of them come to think of it. We miss you who aren't able to yeah. be here. And Jonathan sent a, sent me a note just a little bit ago saying he wasn't going to be able to make it because he's sick. And I don't think you heard that. But yeah. Jonathan said sorry. Jonathan, we hope you feel better. Huh? So if you are joining us on YouTube, thank you so much for being here again. We want to invite you, if you are up for it, to do that whole like, commenting, and subscribing thing. We are getting closer and closer to our thousand subscribers. And for those who don't know, we are trying to get to a thousand subscribers in order to ideally join the YouTube Partner Program and then have a bit more control over how our videos are monetized or not. We would happily demonetize our videos if it meant that we did not have to have those weird ass commercials that show up at the beginning and you know, sometimes in the middle of our videos promoting things that we definitely do not support and would not like to see advertised in the mix of our content. We would really appreciate that not happening. So you get to be part of us taking control if you're up for becoming one of our thousand subscribers. So thank you so much if you do take the time to do that. We also appreciate comments. We love getting comments, especially ones with juicy questions that we need to give some time to answering. It helps us stretch our muscles as much as it might be meaningful for you to reach out to us. We love connecting on that level. So don't feel shy. We love to talk to pretty much everyone who uh, reaches out to us via our comments. So take some time. If something comes up for you during our videos, feel free to chime in down there. And of course, if you appreciate our content, Feel free to like our video and let us know that. We'd really appreciate that too. Anything else I need to add? Um, no. Yep, I don't think we have any news right now to offer, so that's pretty much that. So, for our video this week, we are going to, once again, get a little bit Gurdjieffian, and we are going to be delving into center. Right, Mushtaq? Yes, the magnetic center. Yeah, the uh, actual name of the uh, talk tonight is Building Your Magnetic Center, a step-by-step -step process. Yes, and this is definitely your wheelhouse, my friend, so I can't wait to hear what you want to tell us all about that. Okay, so the first thing I need to tell you about this is that when you read Gurdjieff, and when you read his uh, first generation students, they will make mention of this idea of a magnetic center. And the more you read, the more confused you will get because it is apparent that none of them really know what they're talking about. Um, probably Gurdjieff knew what he was talking about, but he was a rascal, so he's gonna let people go where they go. Some people will say the magnetic center is something that guides you to a school. Uh, and this is in one sense true, uh, but not in the sense that people think. Uh, some people will say the magnetic center is where you uh, accumulate uh, impressions and experience 
that you use to make your uh, astral body so that you have an astral body. The astral body. Yeah, but they call it the Kejdan body. Is that, actually, a is that a Beelzebub's tail term? Uh, yeah, that's, that's where you will first find it. Uh, and basically, it comes from two Persian words. Uh, and, and it means like uh, heart soul or uh, soul. It'll, it's usually translated as soul body, but John is heart. Um, Kes, I don't know, Zainab, what is Kes? K E S or Kafia Sin? Ring a bell? No, I'm like Kessie, someone? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, they say it means like soul body or soul heart. Um, and it really doesn't make a lot of sense. And that's, that's one of the things that I have spent the last two weeks digging through every Gurdjieffian reference I can find, trying to come up with a, uh, a way to describe this. And the one thing that I was clear on at the end of two weeks of looking is that these people don't even know what they're referring to half the time. So, is it a something inside of you that you develop that guides you towards a school? Maybe. Uh, is it something that uh, allows you to uh, experience different stimulus? Um, maybe. But none of it really captures my understanding of it. And, and our understanding of, of it comes out of probably where Gurdjieff got it, which is the, in the Sufi way. Oh, oh yes, there is also the, uh, the magnetic center is what you use to... Uh, begin to unify your eyes. That's the other thing. They say all of these things about it and so what is it? Yes, it is a way to know if you are being exposed to actual teachings of a school. None, nobody here is going to find that useful at this point. Because by the time you have developed that center to the point where it can guide you, you have already been exposed to uh, so much shit that Kyle, take over for a second. Sure. Mm. I'm going to make sure everything is okay. Sorry about that, guys. One sec. Just making sure our house isn't flooding. That's all. <laughs> he heard water running. So, no issues here. Sorry about that, folks. 
It's one of those things where you hear a sound that you know should not be there under any circumstances, and yet it is there. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yes. Right. So you're talking about um, by the time you have developed this center, you encountered a lot of, because you were talking about like being drawn to a school or knowing yeah. you need to be drawn to a school. So. I, I was, I'm curious about where yeah. you were going with that because you were yeah, saying. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, to find the right <laughs> words. Yeah. You do not have this capacity now. It will take a while for you to develop this capacity. And during the time that you are developing this capacity, you will be exposed to so much bullshit that you can become overwhelmed by it. That's where I wanted to hear where you were going. Okay. Yeah, that's where I'm going with it is that, yes, the, the magnetic center will guide you and it can't guide you until you have it. And it takes some time to develop it. And during the time that it takes to develop it, you can't really trust a lot of your intuitions about, is this a school? Is this a teacher? And because of that, you have to use other skills. And that's important because the way I experience the, the world of spiritual teachers out there, it's very much like an ocean. And you are a seal in the ocean, swimming around. And you, have a, and you just bumped into something and have a bloody nose. And you look around and you discover that the ocean is full of sharks. Um, so you're very attractive. To those sharks. Everybody who is on a spiritual path is very attractive to uh, the grifters and con artists out there. For which Noor and I might be too. You don't know yet unless you've known us for a while. Um, you may decide we are grifters. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, if we are, we're not very good ones. So <laughs> we have that going. Um, so Aaron says it's not useful until it's fully developed and the answer is pretty much no it's not when it is fully developed it becomes very useful as a guide until it is developed uh, you cannot count on it it makes it a little scary because it's so tempting to be excited about all this you know enthusiasm that you're experiencing and this growth you feel like you're experiencing around your spiritual development quote unquote and so you know you are as attracted i would say to maybe not as attracted but to some extent you're, you're also attracted to charlatans just like they're attracted to you Oh yeah, it's easy to be fooled before you have this faculty developed. Um, and that takes a while. Yeah, I mean, we can kind of think of it as like, as a spiritual person, you're kind of in your egg stage, right? <laughs> yeah. As they say, you're an egg. So yeah, you are or not you, quite... You are one of the little turtles that are running towards the sea at this yes. point. Yes, yep. And there's a lot of vulnerability there. Yeah. As a matter of fact, being on this path is pretty much exactly you being vulnerable. You have to be. You have to be vulnerable uh, to start out on this path. And that makes it pretty dangerous. So you need to get the magnetic center up and running as fast as possible. Think of it taking maybe a year or more Uh, before it's developed enough to be of use to you. Popular. Yeah. It's 
So as far as being of use, uh, I guess we're going to get into how that comes to be, right? Yep. I'm just taking my time here so that the people who come and watch the first five minutes will watch and then go away so that we can talk about the good stuff. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. <laughs> so. There is the idea also that you need to build this test gen body. This, as far as I'm concerned, has to be taken as metaphor. <coughs> you don't, there is no way for us to say that we have more bodies than the one that we have. There don't seem to be invisible bodies floating around inside of us or outside of us. There's no way to measure it. There's no way to test for it. There is nothing uh, that says that this is an objective thing. So it has to be a metaphor for something. And this is where getting into uh, the uh, spiritual autolysis, the devouring of the the eyes to create a singular eye and the energy released in that uh, becomes something that is akin to like oh I've just developed this new body but it's not so let's talk about what we have to do in order to do this thing and I'm going to pull up uh, I'm going to share a screen with you. I have to tell you that I made this really, really quick and from memory. Uh, can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. So. Marquez Altamizi is uh, usually translated as the center of discernment or the center of uh, being able to tell the difference from one thing or another of actually being able to have discernment and that is i suspect the original name for the magnetic center and it's not like a center in your body it's like a center of focus in order to develop this there are seven steps and I look at it as a kind of um, ascending octave. The first step that you see down here is called uh, the silence in English. Now, we will get back to this uh, diagram, but I want to talk about this because this is the single most important step. In order to begin to develop your center of discernment or your magnetic center, you need to cultivate silence. What this means is you need to start becoming very familiar with your body and being in your body and being able to let go of all of the fidgety energy that you have in your body. You have to actually be able to maintain physical stillness. So a lot of people, when they sit, they will be moving around, bouncing around, fidgeting one way or the other, and they do not have the capacity to just be still. But the first step to developing the magnetic center is to do this. And it's like uh, the, the image I was given is you have a pond and the pond is agitated. Fish are flopping up and breaching the surface and 
turtles are poking their heads up and birds are landing on the pond and there's ripples everywhere. You want to make that pond completely smooth. The practice for doing this goes like this. You sit with your spine erect, or in my case, as erect as I can get it. Um, and you can keep your eyes open or have them closed. And you experience your body as hollow so that you have this thin surface film of skin that is inflated with your awareness. And so you put your awareness into the sense of the hollow body and you let it fill up as if it were air inflating you. And you'll notice any tensions along that surface film and when you find them you let them go. Start with your face but do not go into a trance when you do this. <coughs> Stay completely present in the room, completely present in your body. As old Baba Rum Raisin used to say, be here now. So just be present, feel your body as if it were completely empty, as if your skin were a balloon and as if you were being inflated. This is the single hardest step. You are going to practice this until you can remain still without fidgeting for a decent length of time without going into trance. If I wanted to remain still, I could put myself into a mild hypnotic trance and just say, all right, be still. But I wouldn't be entirely here. I would be focused in, into the trance state. You want to do this without a trance state. You want to have a wide focus, not a narrow focus. You want to have <coughs> very open attention, not limited attention. And you want to be able to perceive everything because once you have uh, mastered this state to any extent, we're going to go back here. We get to step two. Once you have the silence, step two is called the witness, a shahid. If you are, uh, oh, I didn't mean to make that go away. There we go. If you are watching a still pond, you will notice any time that the, uh, the surface of the pond is broken by anything. And that's what you're going to do. You're going to be in the stillness and you are going to witness. You're not going to expect anything. You're just waiting to see what breaks the surface. When something breaks the surface, like a thought. You observe the thought. You witness the thought. You go, oh, there's that thought. And then you let it subside again. This is all pretty standard stuff so far. <coughs> so, step one in building a, a magnetic center is to find your own stillness. And this is stillness of the body, of the mind, and of the emotions. All three. You can't just have one of those.
Step two is when you achieve this, you witness what pops up to the surface. What ripples the pond, as it were. And when you witness that, you just describe it to yourself and let it go. So, I'm sitting here, and then, oh, thought about dinner. Another thought about dinner. I thought about wondering if I'm hungry. All of these things splash to the surface and I just witness them. I don't do anything about it. I don't feel anything particular about it unless it's a feeling that comes up. Those were thoughts. If I'm sitting here and I'm going, oh, what if I'm not doing good enough talking to these people? What if I'm not communicating well enough and I get upset about that, I can go, ah, neurotic upsetness, and let it go. So that's the second step. Go back here. The third step is the judge. Aqadi. Qadi is, uh, I did it again. I'm judging myself now. The judge is the one that determines uh, what is true about a situation. Not just right or wrong, not uh, crime and punishment, but what is true. So, as you begin to witness these various things that come up, you can begin to judge them. In the sense of, Oh, I'm moving my body too much. What is the truth about that? And the truth might be, oh, the truth about this is that I have too much uh, unmanaged energy in my body. Too many unconscious patterns that I have not dealt with yet. And so you begin to do this every time you witness something, you judge it. You don't do anything about it, you just judge it. Here's the truth about that. So judging is telling yourself the truth about what you experience. Then... The sorting. The sorting is kind of fun. This is this is a, a, a fun idea to do. It's like, oh this thought I have judged to be good. I'm going to put it over here. This thought I've judged to be bad. I'm going to put it over here. And I'm going to just start separating uh, useful from useless thoughts. Useful from useless feelings. Useful from useless uh, impressions. Any of these things. And it's not just that category. You can have as many categories as you need. <coughs> yeah. 
when you say category, you're referring to which? Yeah, like category? useful and useless are, are, are two categories. Okay. What might you can be? have happy and sad. Yeah. You can have uh, uh, must act upon, must not act upon, mm -hmm. any of these things. Or like now problem, future problem, yeah. that kind of thing, yeah. right? Yep. So the sorting is when you begin to look at this and go, here are the fragments of my consciousness that come up and this is where they all belong. It's like if you were going to do a puzzle, you're going to put together a puzzle, you might take all of the pieces and spread them out and sort all of the colors into uh, their own areas. So you have all green pieces over here and all blue pieces over here and all red pieces down here. Uh, so that it's easier for you to find a piece when you need it. And then you need to sort it a little bit more. So where are the edge pieces in each of these colors? Do all of the colors have edge pieces or do only some of the colors have edge pieces? And what if they trick me and put some pieces in the middle that look like edge pieces but aren't? Which if I was making a puzzle, puzzle I would certainly do. So, we've gotten this far We have developed the silence, which is the hardest and single most important. We have started witnessing, attending to what is coming up. We have begun <coughs> judging what we're witnessing. We are sorting what we judge, and then we get to five. Um, I'll t I can't even pronounce this because it's got two pharyngealized uh, consonants. Uh, Tahan is how you'd say it in English, but it, it has a different sound. It is, means to grind with a millstone. Once you have gotten to this step, you take all of these things that you have sorted out and you begin digesting them. You begin grinding them. You begin crushing them to extract uh, what is valuable from them. And this is the hardest part. It's even harder than finding the silence because it means that you are basically going to be uh, taking all of these thoughts and feelings that are floating around that are part of your unconscious conditioning because that's what you're finding here and you are taking them apart into their constituent elements <coughs> and extracting the energy from them this is the point of spiritual autolysis this is where you start dialoguing with these parts you know, uh, that's a very common way to do this, either with just yourself or some, or with somebody else. Uh, and you keep going until you have no energy left on the thing, whatever it is. You think of any... Uh... Yeah, I'm trying to come up with a, 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 an example that makes sense of that. <coughs> so. A thought swims up to the surface and goes... 
I just want to do this simple thing. I want to go off and live in a hermitage somewhere. And so the thought comes up and I witness it. And it comes up again and I witness it. And it comes up again and I witness it. Finally it comes up and I can make a judgment about it. I, I look at this thought and say, this thought is not in alignment with my meaning and yet it persists. What's up with that? Yeah. Now I dialogue with the thought. I start, or not with the thought, I start talking to myself about it. Why shouldn't I go off and live in a monastery? Monasteries are nice. I could be the sweeper. I could spend my days sweeping the, the halls and maybe working in the garden some and pulling some weeds and generally just live a quiet life. And then I would have to answer that, you know, with, yes, that sounds good, but isn't that moving away from what your life actually means? And like, why should I have a meaning? Life is meaningless. Is it? Well, yes, but you've created a meaning now, haven't you? Or I've created a meaning now, haven't I? Um, well, yeah, you have this meaning and I still want to just go and sweep the garden. And you keep that dialogue going until there's nothing left of the thought, basically. Does that make sense so far? It does. I think uh, I think that's a good example because I, I know how that works for you. I can think of... Um, you know, dreams that I've had, like recurring bad dreams where it's mm -hmm. like the recurring theme is there. And each time I just unpack it and really question each, each piece, like what about this, you know, why is this so powerful to me that I keep having this dream over and over again? And it's typically not the obvious it's usually about something deeper in terms of rather than how I may feel about the interactions in my dream, which may come from past incidents and such. It's about something inside of me. It's about my relationship to myself, how I view myself in specific contexts, my self-talk that I offer myself, especially if it's negative. So then the truth comes in where I question that. Is that true? Is that always true? Uh -huh. And if it's true, when might it be true? In which case, if I can narrow it down, then I can deepen the conversation with myself about it. And if there's something that is untrue in the negative thing that I may be dreaming about, I can do things that support myself in a positive way to challenge that narrative. But with the piece that's true, I can challenge that specifically. I can say, okay, well, if I'm unhappy with this and I know that it's true, how can I take action to counter it? How can I turn it around through action, meaningful action? And that will help me not only resolve the negative self-talk, but the piece of it that feels true and feels particularly triggering to me. And through that process, I have actually managed to cut down on the dreams that I have had about this particular subject. And to me, that's a sign that this works because I'm not so quagmired in whatever that thing might be. And that gets us to the, uh, the next one. And let me pull it up again. The sixth point is called the gift. And what it is, 
is after you have done this work, there comes a point where you have to surrender to allowing whatever you're working with to be dissolved and to receive the energy back from it that it has been hoarding to hold itself together. This is why it's called the gift. It's also really, really hard uh, to do. And we see this ever so often. When you get these groups who, uh, we won't mention any names, but there are some people out there who claim to work with processes that heal trauma. And in fact, not only do they not heal the trauma, but if you don't have enough trauma, they will create more for you so that you can continue having lots of trauma and cycling through these traumas <coughs> for the rest of your life. There are groups that go so far as to create uh, what they call recovered memories, but are actually implanted memories, so that you can have things to be traumatized about. And this, this goes back to uh, having a magnetic center, so you can avoid groups like this. Because what you do when you are healing trauma is you find the trauma, you heal it, and you let it go. You do not re-stimulate the trauma again. If you have to do that trauma healing more than once, you need to find a better coach or a better teacher. So... The gift is being willing to surrender the thing that you have worked on so that it can be uh, uh, dissolved and the energy that has held it together comes back to you. And that's an important part of this process of building a magnetic center is allowing these things that have floated up and you have witnessed and you have judged and you've worked with in every possible way to finally just be let go. Does that make sense? I see your head nods. I'm glad about mm. that. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I mean, I know that this is, is an unpopular position in today's spiritual marketplace where you're supposed to work on your traumas forever. Uh, but there's no point in even working on your traumas if all you're going to do is relive them over and over and over again. A horrible experience to go through yeah. that over and over and over again. Yeah, and none of what we're describing here has anything to do with reliving your traumas, by the way. Witnessing whatever thought comes up is not reliving a trauma. It's just, oh, there's a thought. And it might be a thought of, when I was five years old, that kid on the, the schoolyard knocked me down and kicked me a couple of times and took my lunch money and I still feel shitty about it. That might be the thought. But it, it, this process asks you not to identify with the thought. <coughs> not to deny it. But don't claim it either. It's just, it's there. And through working with this, we get to this point where uh, you get to reclaim the energy of, of these things that you are grinding up. And that gets us to the very last thing here, number seven, which we call the lodestone. The Arabic actually, I would translate it more as the foundation stone than the lodestone, but this is what we call it in English. And the lodestone is actually something that is magnetic, something that attracts. 
So, when you have allowed yourself to receive the gift of the energy that has been released, it is drawn into this foundation stone, which is a metaphor, not a real thing, or this lodestone or this magnetic center where it begins to form uh, your permanent eye, where the, the eye is single and uh, is available to you at all times where you are not constantly lost in the shifting eyes of the ego, the little eyes. The lodestone is, or the foundation stone, is the foundation upon which you build your, your state and your station of permanent I. <coughs> Does that make sense? So the energy that you receive at six comes up to seven and creates a permanent eye, helps create a permanent eye. Are you talking? Yeah. yeah. Do we have any uh, questions? Yeah, so this far? is the part for questions because I'm done laying out the, the actual process of doing this. So ask questions or give me answers. Yes. Jayesh. Yes, Jayesh. Yeah, I want to have some more clarity on the milling part. Uh, suppose okay. I have a thought that I am experiencing jealousy and then I counter it that no life is okay, fair, and people are different. So there is nothing to be jealous about. But again, that pattern comes up. And again, okay. I am countering it by some observation or some good thought. So how long should I do it? And uh, you need so what, to work on I mean? each. Yeah, you need to work on each of these until they're gone. So, I experienced jealousy. I, I actually did this with jealousy when I was much younger because I didn't ever want to be jealous again. And so I looked at it and went, "Oh, what's going on here? I'm feeling jealous. Why am I feeling jealous? I'm feeling jealous because my partner looked at this other person." What's going on with that? What, what am I actually doing? Aha! When I look at that, I say to myself, this part of me is imagining her with this other person and me excluded from it, and it feels like shit. Okay, there's no reality to that. And yet here it is. So what can I tell myself about it? I can tell myself that I want to be the most important person in my partner's life. All right, but I am the most important per person in my partner's life. And if I'm not, then this is going to end anyway, no matter what. And I will keep doing that. I will keep digging down through this, through this process of literally just eating the emotion and the sensation once I can I identify it. Because you say, I feel jealous. That doesn't tell you anything. It's like, and what you want, and this is the sorting. You know, it's like, what is this, what is this jealousy that I'm feeling? What, how can I describe it to myself? Once I can describe it, once I can sort it out, then I can really tear into it and start taking bites out of it. And it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because you're allowing yourself to feel it on the one hand, but you're relating to it in a sort of dispassionate way. Yes. Yeah, you never deny your feelings, but you never let your feelings run you. So you're not stuffing it down, but you're also not like taking a deep dive into it where you're like, I am just going to live this jealousy all over throughout my whole body and just get lost in it because then it's hard to come out of that. It's hard to come back out of that and yeah. start to unpack it. Even more than that, you will reinforce the feeling. Yes. Yeah. 
I mean, this this is what we're talking about with re-traumatization, right? Like, yeah. When you take a deep dive into this remembered experience, you are reinforcing it. And it is hard to... Uh, it's it's even harder to unpack it then. And the folks who tell you that you have to completely relive a trauma or something like this, this feeling of jealousy to relive it over and over again are creating you in you a point of vulnerability where you will tend to imprint upon them if somebody else is doing this with you. And this is dangerous. Because then you create parent-child relationships with whoever is leading. And you do not want a parent-child relationship in your spiritual life. You don't need a spiritual father or mother. As a matter of fact, a spiritual father or mother will keep you as a spiritual child. Which is, in fact, antithetical to this process that we're talking yeah. about. So, uh, I feel it's like uh, jealousy on a face value, it is a, on a hard shell. But then when I deep, deep dive into it, then different layers opens up. And yes. I keep diving with my conscious attention, consciousness, uh, conscious mm -hmm. energy. And then that energy works on that inner core of that jealousy. Uh, and then it gets dissolved there. And then I can yes. become free of it. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, that's a different way of using the terminology, like taking a deep dive. It's probably, so just, a, probably a better way, actually. Yeah. I just want to make sure people are following. Yeah. Yeah, because as you go deeper and deeper into that feeling without identifying with it that's, that's the, the trick yeah yeah you don't say i am jealous you say oh here is this jealousy and i i had just experienced it you are not the thing you are experiencing the thing and that little step keeps you from re-identifying with the jealousy over and over and over again and it allows you to get underneath the surface layers to the whatever the core is and when you get to the core and you devour it um, all that energy is yours and the jealousy goes away and you can ask Noor she will tell you I'm like one of the least jealous people that uh, she's ever met that's time for your spontaneous unsolicited testimony. You know. <laughs> I mean, it's true though. I, I mean, it's something that I have striven toward myself, but he has often been able to provide me, you know, a, an in-person example of that, which I find helpful. But in any case, uh, oh, I lost my thought. <laughs> Yes, this piece about not identifying with the experience you're having is really important because if you make it, I am jealous, as in I am a jealous person, it's really going to slow you down and it's going to make you feel bad unnecessarily. There's no reason to identify with that when it's possible to challenge it. Sydney has asked a very important question. Yes, uh, Sydney asks, in, is one's meaning clarified through the process of creating the magnetic center? In short, yes, but not entirely. And my plan was to actually do a, a talk specifically on meaning, uh, <sighs> maybe even next Sunday or when we do the the two Sunday or the two talk Sunday I'm not sure when that's going to come up 
because meaning is incredibly important and uh, this will definitely help clarify it in that a lot of the things that come to the surface, a lot of the fish that jump up to make ripples in the pond will have to do with uh, external meanings that have been placed upon you. That's my experience anyway. Does that make sense, Sydney? Good question. Yes, yeah. Anybody else got questions? I can also call on people. Yeah, you may have to start doing that. All right. Uh, David, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm curious about the moment um, when you actually devour the core. Okay, what about it? Um, does it, how do you, how do you know there's not something deeper? Um, because you're not finding anything. Basically. It's like you're drinking a bottle of soda pop. How do you know when you've gotten to the bottom of the bottle? Bottle is empty. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> and that uh, my experience of this is exactly like that. Oh, that bottle's empty. Hmm. I guess it could be described that way. I mean, I guess sometimes I experience it as like don't even know why I'm upset about this anymore. <laughs> I yeah, guess I'm over and, it. Yeah. Yeah, and no two people are going to describe this the same way. Yeah. The best uh, description of this I think I've run across is, okay, somebody does this work and it changes them profoundly. And from the moment that they're finished with a particular thing, their life is no longer the same, but they don't notice it sometimes for weeks or months mm -hmm. yeah. because the change is so natural. It's not like, oh, boom, I'm a totally different person. It's like, oh, I'm the same person. And this is just no longer a problem. Yeah, I mean, the work has been put in, but it was, it wasn't like a, super effort where it was just like you know you're you're vomiting from the struggle the whole time it's kind of like you've taken those day by day steps and suddenly so much has changed around you as a result of your evolving through your practice And yeah, I remember times where I didn't realize how much my life had changed until I became reflective and, and retros, you know, looking at things in retrospect, like, wow, things have changed just without me even realizing how different they are now. Yeah, and that may be one of the real hallmarks of this particular process of working on yourself is that the changes appear so natural you do not immediately notice the change sometimes you i mean it's like think about any habit that you've broken and there's a point where you just stop thinking about it and then yeah sometime later you look back and go oh i have not been motivated to do that habit So you want this natural feeling of, yeah, okay, that's done. Does that help at all, David? Yes, that does help a lot, thank you. Good, I'm glad to hear that. So uh, do you have any other questions? No, that's all. 
Okay, Sydney has got something else going. Yep. So Sydney says, De Salzman, so it was this Madame De Salzman? Yeah, that's Madame De Salzman, okay. who was, if anybody was Gurdjieff's inheritor, it was her. So we okay. pay attention to her. Yes. So she writes a lot about tensions. This is Sydney writing. Yeah. Uh, De Salzman writes a lot about tensions, and I have been following her growing definition of it. The seeing practice is really useful in seeing tensions in the body. During this practice, is there an opening to emotions, parentheses, feelings, close parentheses, too? Are feelings tensions? Um, emotions can be tensions. Feelings are just feelings. You know, you go poke, that's a feeling. Um, I check in with my my skin and my skin goes, it's a little warm in here right now. That's just a feeling. But if I start telling myself a story about that feeling, oh, it's warm in here and I'm sweating and my uh, bottle is out of water and I'm dying of thirst and the next thing you know, I'm going to pass out on screen and people are going to be looking at me like, what the hell is he doing? And I'm going to be totally embarrassed and I'll never be able to show my face on this again. That's a feel. That's an emotion. There's always the story there. Um, so emotions can create tension, but that tension will be reflected in the body. Okay, so Sydney so found that helpful. All right, who else can I bother? Tommy, how about you? Uh, I thought I'd get away with it there. <laughs> Nobody gets away from me. <laughs> um, I've, I've just I find this really, I find this really really interesting because uh, I I work uh, like on the mental health with uh, painting classes with a lot of people suffering with trauma and uh, you can see a lot of. What people are going through, and and uh, I love the fact, like you, you said, it's it shouldn't be a long, 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 repetitive, drawn out process of of hidden trauma where you need to go over and over it again. And uh, there was like a, a, a like I say, a, the non-identifying that for the last few years I've been uh, how I got under the Gurdjieff work again. I was saying he was through uh, Morris Nicole. And his mm -hmm. work, and and that for me, maybe it's because he's a Scotch man or something. <laughs> I find it really, I find it really, really, you know, the easiest way for me to get the get on it, and and uh, I could see that the the non-identifying, and uh, the idea that you could almost look at yourself as a caretaker for yourself, yes, in ways, which which mm -hmm. was good. And I was talking to a boxer <laughs> who was in the mental health sort of group and I would be saying to him that you instead of being the guy in the ring getting beat up you'd be better to be the corner man <laughs> for yourself you know <laughs> and, but it's all very interesting like I said and I love the fact that it's laid out in stages there uh, because sometimes when I had started off I'd get the stage three and I'd just be I'd be watching everything and I, I would nearly I think it was like five different things that c can come on you know um, you know emotions and uh, thoughts and fantasies and you know I, I labeled the five but then what do you do with them you know and it's just really yeah. really interesting to be me and I so. yeah yeah the the noticing them is is the the sorting part and so after that you have what you can do with them That's it. And I loved the analogies you brought up about like the yeah. corner man and the caretaker. I've used that with people before where, you know, you have all these dispersed eyes and they're all like, oh, my God, help. I don't know what to do. I'm freaking out. And there's this, you know, this this uh, non-identified part of us that can serve as kind of the, the herder of the cats. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, who's like, hey, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. I see what you're going through. That's okay. But we are going to direct our attention to this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tommy. I am really pleased and uh, also humbled to hear that this has been part of your practice as well. Yeah. Like I say, this is 
really really great i'm enjoying it <laughs> you know i've been away i've been away for a while you see with, with different stuff and i, I really intend to, to attend a, a lot of the classes like you see it's it was it's great to actually chat to people and uh because you don't get a lot of that you know <laughs> so that's good yeah. thanks yeah. thank you that's awesome yeah. yeah what we try to do here is actually create a virtual version of the school the people who watch this are, are watching theater but the people who are here are participating in the actual class we we don't teach by just front-loading information we teach through dialogue because you're going to be different than Jayesh and Jayesh is going to be different than David and you all need something different and if we can't talk with you about it you don't get it and this is not a one-size-fits-all mystical path. No, and everybody kind of has, I love how we all bring different words to talk about the same thing. And I feel like yeah. that helps a lot. Man, thanks to each of you. Who can I bother now? LaVita. I found this very interesting. Um, because I kind of saw glimpses of what Mushtaq spoke about in my own life. But I have to admit, as far as practice goes, I kind of left the room when you said be silent. Yeah, that's the hardest one for most people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, anybody who's known me for more than 10 minutes knows silence isn't one of my overarching characteristics. So. Maybe you just need to find the language that works for you, that is more resonant with, you know, your, how this is experienced in your body and in your life. And silence may not be that word. Yeah. Or you may just need to ask yourself, who are you when the words aren't there? Oh, I can That's be it. silent. I can be silent. I can do it. I just don't like to. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's a two-sided coin because discipline is doing things that we may not love, but know that it's helpful to us, healing to us. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. But you get to decide what words you want to use for the same practice, you know? Um, I don't think it's really the words. I think it's more like um, somebody said once that the problem is the person in control of me just doesn't have a tight ship, doesn't keep a tight ship, and unfortunately, who's in control of me? You are, yes, yeah. So, yeah. You know, so it's 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 not it's not the it's not the content. It's just like um, I'll admit, though, it's a little bit higher on the scale than Wilhelm Hoff's work. I'm more likely to do that than <laughs> this. Than That's surprising. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do. I'll, yeah. I'll be silent forever rather than you know ice baths. You could get that. There you go. Feel you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I feel you. Thanks, Olivia. That's great. Um. We have not heard from Cherie yet. I've not heard from Sheree and Aaron. I want to hear from you too. I know you're going to need a minute to type, so I'm just giving you a heads up. The silence uh, and stillness part always makes me think of a pond uh, or a cultivating the clarity within me in the stillness. And if I let that clarity get stained with an emotional hurt, then that's go through the whole system of me and do I really want that? So the way I've operated uh, instinctively and then meeting people like yourselves over the years, different people that have helped me see that if you keep looking through that lens, it just stains the water all the time. And is that what I want? No, I want to keep washing that out, washing that out until I'm not even thinking about it anymore. So that's how I kind of think of it. And the milling process of the refinement of that all the time, it, it's like it starts off as a big granite ball and it goes down to a grain of sand until I don't even notice it anymore. 
Because even a grain of sand bothers you in your shoe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That tiny thing, you think you're done? No, you're not. You've still got that grain of sand. So it, you know, I'm always um, grateful for those around me in the community who can say, you're doing this, Sheree. You're doing this event. Again, because, you know, I've got too tired and I've let myself uh, succumb to the indulgence of picking up that emotional hurt again. It is an indulgence. And I'm thinking, wow, that takes a lot of energy to cultivate that. So why aren't you using that energy to cultivate that which refines you higher and higher? So that, that, yeah, that, that speaks to me, Sheree. Thanks. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, you think you've got 100 points of energy a day and you squandered two points on this, two points on that, two points on this. And so you've got really nothing left and you can't really cultivate something that's really worthwhile. It was rubbish, you know. So you think, well, what do I need to do? Take action and, and these steps help you take that action. Like really, are you really giving yourself a proper assessment? Ah, oh, I did it again. <laughs> Oh, but I was really wounded compared to you. I was really wounded. I'm thinking, oh, give it up. <laughs> give it up. Dog with a bone. Give it up. And, and sometimes, you know, we joke around in, in my, there you go, bone. <laughs> You're doing it again. You got that bone again. I love how you and your friends have those little, like, code words that are like, mm, I'm calling you out with love. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like, wow. Well, and I love one person said to me, well, she said it in an explanation that she said to her son who was having a moan about something. She said, you're having a gale force whinge. <laughs> gale force whinge, yes. I thought, well, there we did. We just dropped down again and we, we saw that with a child who was creating the habit of whinging. And you just think, uh, how do you arrest that? So in a way, we are like children who need to be reminded, let that bone go. You know, and then, as you said, the re when you go down further down the track and people go, do you remember when? And you go, no, no I don't. <laughs> because I don't put any energy in that. Yeah. And, and it's, it's funny because so people will wonder why you don't care about it anymore. And they want to, like, understand you or, or put you in a box. So yeah. they want you to care about that thing that you're just, you're over it. Yeah, because I've actually, instead of looking back, I've turned around and I'm looking forward and I'm putting my energy forward. Sometimes I slip back, but yeah, I'm human. But that, yep. that's the thing. And so if I pick up that emotional wound and stain my awareness, my existence, my every day, how does that make me feel? So I have to look at what is it like to have that feeling of silence and clarity and that peace from it. That's what I'm looking for, that peace, emotional peace. I'm just where I yeah. Like. Yeah, that's where I want to be. Perfect, so, Sheree. Thank you. Awesome. That was good. Yep, let the bone go, everybody. All right, uh, Aaron says... I definitely have an easier time catching my reactions when they are habitual and I can let them go more often because of it. They then become less excessive, it seems. Yeah. Yeah, those are the easier things to work on in a way. If, if once they have been brought to your attention and you're able to see them as they arise and it happens again and again, you're like, oh. I see you now. I'm going to get you this time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then they become less excessive. You know, it may not be an overnight fix. Like we were talking about jealousy earlier. But as you unpack, it's kind of like each time it comes up, it's almost like it's quieter and quieter. Just like Sheree was talking about going from a giant boulder, you know, giant millstone to a sand grain and then to dust and then to nothing. No. Yeah. Uh, Eric says, it's greatly diminished stress that doesn't need to be there. Yes. I mean, that's, that's kind of how I experience it too, in the sense that 
as I said, it's it's like I, I don't even why am I why was I upset about this? I'm I'm done. I can put it down now. Thanks, Aaron. Um Zainab, how about you? What have you been thinking about? What questions might you have? I was uh, thinking of moving from sorting to grinding. Is it where you um, you don't act on that particular thought or emotion? And then, yes. Yeah, you definitely don't act on it, though you do really take a deep look into it as you are not acting on it. Mm -hmm. So is it like that point is where you pass to number five yeah okay, yeah. okay. other than that uh, very good I'm very happy this topic came up it was um, yeah a little bit confusing but now it's good good um, to hear that Sydney asks, oh, was that it, Zainab? I don't want to interrupt. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, Zainab. Uh, Sydney asks, do we know what happens to the fixation once the magnetic center is formed? So you're talking about the... Uh... The chief feature. Yes. Um, the chief feature has less control over you and your flow through the various different states becomes a little bit more fluid. Remember, the chief feature is the fixation of attention. If your attention, if your attention does not fixate on that point of the chief feature, then it just keeps flowing. Cool. Any last questions or thoughts? Well, I have a thought, which is What's that your Norm, you and I are going to do seven videos, and not as Sunday talks, but just seven instructional videos, taking everybody who's interested through each of these seven steps in depth and detail. I like this uh, thought. Yeah, I think that this is an excellent thought. And if, if we hadn't done this, I would have never thought of that. So, yay. <laughs> yay. All right. So I'm going to make note of that. And make note of that. You and I will discuss what that might look like in practice. And we will all let you know what emerges from that conversation. Yeah, it'll, it'll end up on, on the YouTube so everybody has access to it, but it will be much more in-depth than we can do in an hour and 20 minutes or whatever it's been. Now an hour and a half. I guess it's a perfect time to go on Brady Bunch mode. Yes, it is. Here we are. Each of every, of all, of every one of us. We all are. So thank you everyone who's able to be here live. It's been so great to have you. And yeah. you guys have, as usual, shared many lovely thoughts, questions, inspirations. And I know Mushtaq and I and all of our friends here really appreciate that. So thank you. Yep. So we can all wave to goodbye to each other and everyone watching on YouTube. And we'll yeah. catch everybody next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks.